Good morning, everybody. Um, I can see you all beginning to, to come in. That's great. Uh, welcome to this morning's webinar. Uh, delighted to have you all with us. Brilliant to see you all safe and well. Uh, my name is Faina Stoney. I'm going to be hosting today's session. Uh, as usual, if you can hear me, if you can see our screen, uh, you might pop onto the chat and just let us know uh, that you can hear us and see us and everything's working well on your end. Uh, the Now the bi-weekly weather update. It's a beautiful morning here in Dublin, but again, I called the parents this morning. It is overcast in Mayo uh, and they're actually expecting thunderstorms. So uh, let's hope they stay on the West Coast. Apologies to anybody else who happens to be on the West Coast this morning. Um, brilliant morning, Anthony. Hi, Neve. Orla, Lisa. Brilliant. Helen, thanks so much. Good morning, everybody. Okay, so welcome to the first webinar in our new Trust Insight series. I'm delighted to see so many of you uh, here with us today, both most of you who are who are part of our Staying Connected series, but also some, some new faces. So delighted to welcome you to, to today's session. We've pivoted our focus um, with this new series to look at the current and future reality uh, of work. And we're kicking off with our, our first expert panel. Uh, we'll be doing our, our full intros later on, but delighted to have Barbara Berry, Helen Gallagher and Carolyn O'Malley here with us this morning. Um, like I said, we'll be doing the, the detailed intros this morning. Um, this morning, we're, I'm going to be hosting along with my colleague Jim Flynn, uh, a partner here in Great Place to Work. And this webinar is going to be continuing on kind of a bi-weekly basis. So our next webinar is going to be on Thursday, July 9th. A uh, small amount of housekeeping. This recording will be available afterwards, so don't worry, we will get that out to you. Uh, we will be wrapped up within the hour. Uh, and without further ado, I am going to hand over to Jim Flynn to get us started. So Jim, over to you. Thanks very much, Fania, and uh, thanks to everybody for joining us, and thanks very much to our panellists. Um, I'm really excited about our current sort of transition because in talking to clients, what we're hearing a lot of is lots of things have changed and what, what in all of that can we rely on? What is going to stay the same and how are, do our plans need to adapt into the future, into the rest of this year and, and into next year? So um, I'm delighted to, first of all, talk to Barbara Berry, who works in Cassie in, in uh, Dublin, which is Credit Agricole. Um, Barbara has worked for over 20 years in, uh, in HR. She's, an exper she's very experienced, particularly in financial services, uh, having worked for 11 years in Friends First, followed by Aircom, Central Bank, and then joining Cassie, I think, in 2017. Um, she's got a master's in HR uh, and a very experienced HR professional. Uh, she's also gone for an upgrade by a, a Dublin lady marrying a, a monster, a very good monster <laughs> man, is what I understand. And um, <laughs> she, 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 she likes to swim in the sea. Uh, and, and so on. So we're looking forward to, to get into that discussion with you, Barbara. So Barbara, just getting straight into it, really what, what we're really curious about here is what has remained, I suppose, top of your list in terms of your priorities mm. and what have, you, what have you needed to change and adapt and what have you learned from all of that? Sure. Uh, thanks, uh, Jim, and good morning uh, to everybody on the panel and to everybody listening in today. Uh, so excited to be here today to talk about uh, all of these these things, I guess. Uh, just a little bit to say about uh, Cassie, first of all. So uh, obviously in the last uh, number of months, well, since 2017 and then during the, the COVID uh, period, I've been working very closely with uh, our managing director, Mary Ryan, uh, and uh, also our senior management and our management and leadership uh, team. I suppose since the beginning of the pandemic, we've been... Uh, following things very closely and uh, we uh, in Dublin have 22 different nationalities uh, in our office here in Dublin. We also have a branch in Paris and a branch in Milan. So I suppose uh, the first thing to say is really um, by means of an introduction that uh, when, when this uh, COVID uh, pandemic started to uh, spread, I guess, outside China, uh, we were watching Milan very closely and we were planning um, I suppose, for how we would manage the potential spread of the virus and the risks uh, which would present themselves. Um, so I suppose we set up our, our, our health and safety uh, committee meetings, our risk management committee meetings, uh, and we met regularly 
um, I suppose, from January onwards. And by the time the announcement came on the 12th of March from Leo Varadkar, uh, we were ready to make sure that everybody was able to, to work from home um, and that they could work uh, remotely. Um, at all times, I suppose, it's important to say that at all times uh, since then and, and continuing uh, into the future, the health and safety and wellbeing of our staff was of absolute uh, paramount uh, importance to us. So I know you did the, the uh, Pulse survey recently, Jim, and I suppose I just want to say that it was very useful to have that uh, anonymous feedback from our staff, uh, which we've used in conjunction with other channels of feedback to help us uh, to understand, I guess, what our employees are, are going through, what they're experiencing, and to help them to, uh, I suppose, to help us to tailor um, you know, the, the supports that are required uh, to, to each of our staff. So to focus on, I suppose, what we have learned and, and what's worked well and, and what our plans are for the next 12 to 18 months, well, I suppose important to say that we, we have continued uh, completely business as usual. Uh, we regularly meet uh, and communicate and uh, listen to all of our staff in Cassie. And we do that through different fora. In fact, one of those things is happening right at this moment, which is our monthly breakfast meeting, uh, which all uh, staff attend. So we've continued to do our monthly breakfast meetings, our team meetings, our one-to-one -one meetings. Uh, we have continued to recruit uh, during the pandemic. So we've recruited uh, 12 uh, new staff, uh, onboarded them uh, remotely. Uh, we've had our induction programs, we've had our focus groups, uh, we've had our management lunches. This is where our senior managers and managers meet with uh, an invited uh, group of staff and uh, we've continued to do all of that. We've also run some workshops uh, on presenting uh, for staff and, and virtual meetings so that they gain the skills uh, to work in this, in this new uh, environment, I guess. So I suppose the, these events have continued throughout the pandemic and what we've learned is that they've worked really well actually, uh, better than I would have thought uh, in fact. We've also had lots of things like social nights, uh, like quiz nights, uh, we've had, uh, for example, on the quiz night, that, that was a lovely evening. It was joined by our staff and their families. Uh, and it was nice to see them at home with their families or with their flatmates uh, or with their partners. And uh, we even had some dogs joining, actually. So a very social event. Uh, we've had coffee mornings. We've had virtual Friday pubs, cooking demonstrations from our staff. Um, and they've shared with us things like, and this is part of the culture at Cassie, I suppose, they've shared with us things like their favourite recipes, dishes from their home countries, for example, uh, Russia, Belgium, France, uh, Poland, uh, Morocco. So I, I suppose really the benefits of, of continuing uh, to communicate and connect uh, as a team and a community at Cassie throughout this crisis have been really numerous uh, for us. And in in... I suppose just to say, uh, Jim, in planning to get back to the new normal and in having gone through this long crisis, I think what's important for us really, uh, and I imagine for many businesses out there, is uh, to make sure that we learn from the experience. So I suppose learning from the experience for us is uh, uh, reflecting, I guess. Uh, so learning from experience comes from reflection. And as our staff come out of this crisis and start to come back to work, uh, what we've started to do is to have discussions, uh, discussions with all our staff about what everybody's learned from this time. Uh, so we've all had to test out different routines. Uh, we've had to test out different ways of working. And I suppose what I want to hear from our staff is what worked, uh, what didn't work, and then keep evolving what we thought were our best practices uh, in light of that. And maybe just, just to give you an example, I suppose I recently... Uh, took the opportunity at a virtual management uh, lunch with our staff to have a discussion with our staff uh, about how they've managed uh, during uh, this period of COVID, how they've managed working remotely um, and how they felt about it. And I've also had discussions with our managers about the challenges uh, that they've had, uh, challenges sometimes with technology, uh, also uh, juggling kids, juggling work, uh, maybe supporting a partner who's who's working from home as well, and then maybe working uh, in a flat where you're sharing uh, the flat with many other people. So we've discussed lots of lots of things, and it's been really beneficial. We've discussed things like productivity, uh, we've discussed Zoom fatigue, uh, we've discussed the benefits of working remotely, uh, we've discussed keeping connected and how that's working for us. Uh, we've even discussed things like loneliness. We've discussed well-being. 
Uh, we've discussed being apart from, from family and for many of our staff, uh, like we've all obviously been apart from our families during COVID, but because many of our staff are uh, not in their home country, uh, this has been particularly difficult uh, for them. Uh, in our wellbeing tips uh, every day and in our, in our um, wellbeing uh, focus groups, we have discuss moods even. So managing moods as part of our day. And I know certainly at periods during this pandemic, people were saying things like, you know, uh, it's not that you're in a particular mood one day, but your mood can go up and down uh, during the day. But I suppose as well as that, we've discussed um, our hopes and our plans and learnings for the future. And what we're doing now is we are continuing to engage with our staff uh, in the coming weeks in this way. And as, I, as, yeah. that, like so, so in terms of those kinds of learnings from managers, let's say in terms of mm. just take one example about managing performance. What yeah. Kind of specifically, have have you learned that you will carry into the future? Uh, well, I suppose as part of I suppose what we're doing is working with our staff and our managers to to continue and plan and and figure out. Um, I guess what the future will look like and what the new normal will look like. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the learnings I suppose has been that uh, the crisis has definitely reinforced the need uh, for our leaders to be flexible and compassionate. Uh, okay. So the, the, the COVID pandemic wasn't something that any of us could have imagined or, or could have wished for, of course, but it did teach us, I think, in a very practical and real way that trust really matters. And we know we talk about trust in great place to work uh, but but I think it's it's really taught us in a very practical way that trust matters so uh, what we've learned is that when you allow staff to make some choices uh, for themselves they feel a greater sense of loyalty uh, and they reciprocate uh, that trust that they've been shown so like for for our managers and leaders this has been a, a positive time in some respects in that um, it's meant that they've maybe had to be a little bit more hands-off when it comes to scheduling and planning um, but maybe a lot more hands-on in figuring out how their people are doing uh, on a daily basis, you know. Uh, so this is where our leaders have had to sort of really trust, uh, take the opportunity to maybe step back a bit and understand more about their employees' uh, hopes, concerns, values, interests, um, and so on. There's a little bit of a shift in emphasis, so in terms of the communication into mm. the more compassionate language around feelings, hopes, desires, moods. Yeah. All of those words which which are, I suppose, dialed up a little bit, are they? In, would that be fair to say? Yeah, yeah, absolutely dialed up a bit. I think like we're we're so proud of all of our team at, at Cassie. And I suppose to say that our experience has been that like each and every member of our staff have absolutely done an incredible job uh, continuing to work uh, during the pandemic from home. So like, like it's really through their commitment and dedication and resilience uh, and their adaptability to change uh, both individually and as a team uh, that I guess has meant that we've been able to to keep the business running and in fact maintain product productivity levels uh, mm -hmm. as well as morale. So I think, I think yes, uh, dialing up those things, Jim, absolutely. Like it was certainly an opportunity for our managers and leaders uh, mm -hmm. To, to lead in this crisis. And they've demonstrated that ably uh, with their skills and competencies. And I suppose we, we were fortunate in that we had launched a, a management development program in 2018 and 2019 uh, for all of our managers and leaders. And uh, we really saw those skills uh, coming to the fore and being put into practice uh, with the staff in terms of managing, uh, I guess, in this new way and dialing up some of those things. Um, We've also, of course, become uh, adept rapidly at uh, using technology, running virtual meetings, um, and we thank our, our IT teams for this. So uh, I, I suppose for the future, I don't know, Jim, do you want me to talk a little bit about what the future looks like or? or... Yeah, so, so, so yeah. I suppose in that, so, so what are you going to carry forward from all of that? And because what yeah. you've done is you, you, you've, you've worked with new technology in terms of a, a renewed focus on communication mm -hmm. and it shifted in terms of leadership and your existing investment mm -hmm. into middle management kind of really yeah. paid off your preparedness paid off yes and then, and then this this more compassionate side which is particularly important given the individual mm. challenges people are facing mm. what do you feel of that will will be really useful to you for the rest of this year and into next year 
Yeah, well, I suppose um, lots of things, really. I mean, one thing to say, I guess, is that before the pandemic, uh, we've been working at CASI on, on a smart working or remote working uh, policy. And for us, it's been uh, really critical that we've managed uh, this whole COVID-19 situation uh, in the way that we have. So maintaining the culture and the well-being of our staff during this period of time has been absolutely critical for us. And I guess you could say that this has been the most extensive pilot program for smart working or remote working that could have been implemented. So, so what does the future look like for us? Well, we've certainly learned that we can work remotely uh, and, and we have and we definitely will continue to embrace more flexibility uh, around working from home and having virtual teams. And I suppose what we found is that that's been more possible than we thought it was. So uh, we've even found that there's been some productivity gains coming from, uh, for example, not having to com commute and uh, for employees in being able to, to work remotely. And they've told us that, you know. So we have the technology and, and we, we have the managers and team leaders that are well equipped to, to manage their teams remotely. And just to go back again to, to an absolutely key facet of this for, for us and the key facet of this has been trust, uh, the trust that we have between our staff and our leadership team. So, so we told our staff at the very beginning of this uh, process that we trust them to get the job done. We said that to them. We told them that we understood that uh, it, it's a challenging time. We communicated from the top down in the organization that we would be flexible with our teams uh, in terms of their personal situations and experiences. And, and we simply told them to do their best. So like consistently and repeatedly, we told them that we were there to support them. Uh, we let them know that we understood that uh, they may from time to time, for example, need to spend time doing some homework with kids uh, during the day, maybe attending a meeting, um, maybe caring for a vulnerable person, uh, or even taking a break themselves. So, so we, we gave uh, wellbeing tips to our staff every single day. Uh, we emailed them uh, wellbeing tips. And uh, I suppose what we encouraged them to do then themselves was take a break when they needed it during the day and that we would be flexible with them. So like, you know, we wanted them to put into to practice some of those wellbeing tips and they were things like, you know, uh, yoga, um, you know, we had uh, body balance classes online, we had body combat classes online. We even wanted them to go out for a walk, uh, get some fresh air, clear the head uh, during the day. And I suppose uh, both they and we were flexible uh, during this time. And I suppose what we've done through that flexibility and trust is delivered and managed very well. Uh, in this environment, and that that those that the the environment and the high levels of trust that we have as a team uh, really creates a great platform for us now. So so it means now that uh, as we're moving into the reopening phases of the roadmap, we can work together collaboratively uh, with our staff to establish what the what the new normal uh, will be for us. So at, at Cassie, I suppose we're using this opportunity to shape. Uh, the new normal and the future of our organization and, and the policy going yeah. forward. That's, that's great, Barbara. Thanks very much. We're going to come back to you a little bit later mm. as questions come in. Mm. And um, uh, look, that, that, that's been really, really interesting. Um, Carolyn, I, I'd like to uh, move on to talk to you next, if I could. Um, so first of all, for those people who may not be familiar with Science Foundation Ireland, it's a government, uh, it works with the government departments uh, in research and innovation and was particularly involved in terms of key projects for frontline healthcare, diagnostics, infection control and so on, contract tracing uh, around COVID-19. So Science Foundation Ireland makes a big contribution, an outsized contribution, I would say, in terms of innovation and development across the country uh, and was particularly involved in, 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 uh, in terms of COVID-19 uh, while all of this was going on. And of course, uh, Carolyn then is head of HR for, for Science Foundation Ireland. And also, Carolyn, uh, you, you uh, are also getting married, I understand, to a Corkman. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so quite pleased about that, right? So just continuing that theme. Um, and it was about to happen on the 14th of March. And then Leo made an announcement. Uh, it, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's really a tragedy. Yeah. <laughs> well, 
Thanks, Jim. Good morning. Um, yeah, I, I suppose on that, Jim, yeah, I, I think my mother-in-law, or to be put it best, when she quoted Woody Allen, and she kind of said, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. That was the reaction <laughs> on, the, on the 13th of March when we were all ready to go and um, leave Dublin and go down to Cork and get married. But these things happen. Um, yeah, and I think for us, it was quite an interesting one because we had... You know, in work, I'd finished work on the Wednesday and we had plans. We had, I had plans in place for, for, for taking some time off, three or four weeks to go get married and go on honeymoon. And it was an incredibly busy period prior to that because with, as you mentioned, we're a government agency. We are under the Department of Business. And actually, the Director General was actually over in Washington, um, you know, for St. Patrick's Day, medalists, we've awards ceremony. So we were acutely aware of what was happening, not knowing what was going to happen. But we were, we were quite monitoring it very closely because we had a lot of travel to Washington for around St. Patrick's Day um, in, in, with other government ministers. So that was something that was very much on our radar. Um, and I think then the, the announcement, it did come as a shock to us all. I don't think we thought it was going to come um, the day it did. However, I suppose one thing that we had at least prepared for to some extent was is we had as part of our business continuity planning about a week or two weeks prior to, to, to the shutdown, for want of a better word, we had actually trialed some remote working organizational wise so we actually did a test um and I, when we look back on it in hindsight we did a day because we thought two days was probably too much which ironically <laughs> now like you look back and you laugh and you go oh my god but we did at least we did have remote working so again looking at plans and how things change we did have a remote working um policy in place in sfi um, i was in with you actually the week before uh, yes. Week before you were getting, and I was wishing you luck in, in terms of we, we were going through that really awkward phase of do we shake hands, do we not shake hands? Exactly. And we, yeah. We and, and, and so on and so forth. So it seems like so much has changed since then. And then talking direct to you directly after uh, when you came back to work, you seemed to just take that whole piece so much in your stride. It was, it was, it was uh, impressive. Well, you know, it was a kind of one of those things where it was good to get back into work on the Monday of the 16th of March instead of the following month. It was a good distraction and there was plenty to do, to be honest, after what had happened. I was very involved with the executive team in charge of the crisis management planning that we had initiated the week prior to it. So we were ready to some extent, but there was a lot more to do um, because we had tested and we had seen where there were some pinch points. So for example, in HR, one issue that we had um, at least identified before the shutdown was is that our access to our payroll was 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 a challenge remotely. So we just had to had to work around that, and we did. And it was something that we kind of had thought about for a long time. Oh, we must look at that, upgrade the system, and we just did it very quickly and very rapidly. And it was no no real issue on it. Um, so we had we had we had actually moved office in SFI last year. So we had changed offices. So that was a huge change in departure to us. But again, looking back, and there was a lot of good things that prepared us for the, the current phase. We'd moved from desktops to laptops. So everyone at least had the, the technology. Um, so we didn't have to, I know a lot of uh, other companies had had maybe difficulty in that regard in sourcing equipment. I think Dell went, you know, had a backlog a mile long with companies that maybe not everyone did have laptops. So we had we had that, we, 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 we were well prepared in that regard. But very quickly we had to, again, you know, we, we were following the government advice in it. But again, you're looking at, for us, what we're often doing is looking at the private sector and we're in the government. So we have to make sure that we are following, we're being as, as progressive and doing the right thing, but always looking at the government roadmap and making sure that there's a very consistent uh, messaging around that because we do have that responsibility. So very quickly, what we had to do is we had, as part as Jim mentioned, we uh, launched a COVID response plan, um, which is a funding call that would normally take, take some time, but we did that very quickly. So immediately, following the lockdown when we all transitioned to remote working more or less overnight, we had an incredibly busy period. And then again, it's a testament to the staff in SFI who are so dedicated to what they do that just adjusted with the difficulty of home challenges. And one thing that I've learned is I think everyone's experience of COVID has been very different. So we're all experiencing it, but your experience is different. So everyone has, you know, childcare is obviously something that's a, it, that's a factor, but other people have other caring responsibilities or other challenges. And again, not everyone has that, has a, has a home office. So again, Barbara, as you mentioned, you know, there's some people that just don't have the optimal setup as well. So we have to be cognizant of that. 
But broadly speaking, other than the fact that our policy, I should say, is we were just about to launch the, the policy of the day a week. And obviously that now is just gone out the window. That will never see the light of day again, because that now just doesn't actually make any sense in this new world. Because it was still, what well, we saw it as being progressive. Um, it still had a lot of limitations around it, when it in compared to what we know now. At the time, it didn't. From where we are now, it probably just doesn't go far enough. And again, this is something that we are going to monitor and learn from during this it just this, this experience. We have to, um, as much as possible, continue the business as usual model. Um, but I suppose in a couple of elements, what we've done is we've had to adapt or pivot to how we do that. So for example, recruitment, we immediately had to do an assessment of all our recruitment competition. We had a lot on at the, at the time um, and they were all midstream. Some were <clears throat> about, <clears throat> about to go live, <clears throat> excuse me. Others were uh, maybe at first interview, or second interview. So we did have to uh, you know, sit down and assess how we would continue with that. And also the timing of those, those placements. Would we pause them? Will we delay them? Will we stagger them out for maybe depending on the role or what the role requirements were as to when they could potentially join. As, a, as it happened, we progressed actually with all of our roles. We didn't put anything on pause. We just maybe had to work with the hiring managers as to how the onboarding would work. Um, and we wanted to put a lot of effort into that. I'm always quite conscious that starting a new job is very daunting for anybody. Um, it's always, that first day is always tough. And I think it's even more difficult now when it is this virtual world. So we're just trying to make sure that the buddy program's in place, that there's good induction, that there's, we've, we've started the virtual coffee mornings, which are more the casual, just drop in for a virtual coffee, just so that we meet others. Mm -hmm. Because we do spend a lot of time on Zoom with people in our own teams and our own groups, I suppose, because they're all scheduled. So that chance encounter um, of just bumping into somebody while you're making your coffee is something that we, we I suppose we are, we're having to try and think about. Um, so recruitment has continued <clears throat> and now we're looking at things like learning and development. This is one thing that we're trying to grapple with <clears throat> because we were about to launch in 2020 a new kind of management development, leadership development program or something we're, we're, we're working towards. And with the learning and development platform we've had, we launched a mentoring program, for example, last year, which was a pilot mentoring program internally. Um, but a lot of that mentoring program is centered around, um, you know, coffees or going for a walk. And we, we, we used to encourage people to go out to Ivy Gardens where, we, where, where, where the office is located and have their chat and do what worked for them in that mentoring setting. So it could be in the office, it could be more informal. And that is now something we just need to assess and reflect upon how we can reintroduce that in our priorities now. I suppose our first priority was getting, you know, it was the crisis mode, then it was the recovery. We're now looking at the return, but then there is those other additional areas that we want to look at. Operationally, you know, for example, another thing that we did look at was annual leave. So we didn't change anything in annual leave. However, what we did do is we looked at, we had a carryover balance that you know, our leave cycle runs January to December. So leave will be used usually in the first quarter. So we have to make a quick decision. Are we going to enforce this or are we not? So again, in conjunction with the executive team and senior management, we looked at options here. Again, always thinking of a flexible and a fair way to manage this. Because we had a very busy 2019, actually, we had probably a little bit of a larger than normal carryover. Um, and because of the COVID response and how actually busy it was within SFI in, in, in March, April, May, a lot of staff hadn't taken leave. So we made a couple of decisions on that particular item. So what we did is we didn't enforce the carryover limitations, but we did actually ask staff to take the same leave around the June bank holiday and the August bank holiday. Again, that was to use annual leave to make sure that we were chipping away at it, but also again, knowing the organization as well, we didn't just make a decision on it. We, we, did, we did a temperature check to see how this would work. Um, and again, it was to make sure that there was a general pause and a break as well. There was no time to take leave, even though people wanted to take even just a day's leave, just for a rest. Um, oftentimes just the, the busyness and the workload was maybe preventing people who are really dedicated to what they're doing to, to take that leave. And I think we all know when you take holidays, sometimes you work the run up to it and sometimes the return from it can be really difficult because you're on leave and the rest of the world is, is continuing as normal. Whereas this gave us this June bank holiday, the day either side of it, gave a little bit of time just to reflect and for people to switch off mm -hmm. entirely. And that's probably something else that we're trying to adjust to now is the boundaries. Because again, 
I think in SFI, where we have the workforce is incredibly committed and work incredibly hard. So the boundaries of now having no boundaries between work and home means that again, using the, using the Great Place to Work uh, poll survey, and we've done another couple of, uh, of surveys and we will continue to do them smaller poll surveys and polls. One thing we're finding is, is that hours are potentially that bit longer. Mm -hmm. I think people maybe always thought that in from remote working, you'd have more time in your day and they get up and they meditate or go for a run. Whereas in reality, a lot of people are, and myself included, and I'm trying to, trying to change this, actually not stay on, go straight onto the laptop and not stay on the laptop until, you know, because you don't have that natural time to kind of get up and go to your bus or your train or your dart or, 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 or to get beat the traffic. So time can be something that we just need to look at. Um, going forward. Yeah. Are you so, so just if I could come in there for one second, just, just say, so a lot of your strategic priorities, you know, have remained consistent. Like it's a question of how it is you do the various things that you do that that's really taking up a lot of your time and concentration. Exactly. It is. So we, we are we are not trying to stop anything. We're trying to continue as normal. And we do have we're very ambitious and there's a lot that we don't want to do. And our own strategy in SFI is to be launched. So we have a new five-year strategy that's underway at the moment and will be will be launched hopefully as soon as we have a government formation. So we, we you know we are moving forward and I think now more than ever we can see the value um, of, 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 of what we're trying to do within the organization. It's incredibly important. So we are trying to move forward but pivot I think and adjust to the different scenarios. Like with the performance management for example we will our our our, our, our year runs from January to December. So we're now coming to the point where we've just probably missed the that meteor point where we usually encourage those meteor conversations. Mm -hmm. um, but rather than just doing the, the standard, here's your meteor conversation, prompt to managers, we'll probably put a bit of a messaging around it as well to be sensitive to the fact that, you know, some people's maybe initial goals that they had looked at in January might have been no longer feasible. Things have changed. So to be quite compassionate on that and understanding of it and to, again to what I think Barbara mentioned is is to say you know we trust you we know that this is happening we know that this is difficult and to acknowledge it that it is not a normal year so it's always trying to find the balance I find that you know in one sense we're trying to find or operate as normal and you know it's working really well productivity is really good but there are challenges with that and I think some of the recent feedback I've heard, not just within SFI, but from talking to colleagues and other HR professionals and other organizations is, is sometimes I strive to, we're, we're, look, we're moving ahead and everything's great and, you know, there, there's no lack of productivity and this is all wonderful, can sometimes trigger something in the few people that are really struggling with it, that it's not normal <laughs> um, necessarily, but again, we were very much adaptable humans and we are very much becoming more uh, certain as to what's happening. But we've we've had the certain phases of it, and now we're potentially embarking on another change where people might have a routine now that works at home, and they have their their childcare arrangements, maybe however they're working it. And now there's that: are we back to the office? You know, are we back on the tenth of August? What does that mm -hmm. look like? So what we're doing in that regard, we have a crisis management team, a COVID response team, and we've also just set up a new health and safety team as well um, to really put that at, at the front and foremost of everyone's everyone's minds. And what we're looking at, we're collaborating with another, we're a multi-tenant building as well. So we're collaborating with, with our co-tenants there as well. And there's another couple of government agencies. So we do need to work collaboratively together on it. We're very much looking at our staff's preferences to some extent on this but managing expectations as well is that for the remainder of this year in particular we're working from home can happen we will support that we don't do what we last year when we moved office we went from having parking to having no parking which was a huge change and the staff embraced it so remarkably uh, we transitioned you know very much to foot, to train, to dart, to everything else. Um, and it was a huge change for everyone. And it was done with absolute, you know, just the, the support that everyone gave each other um, in terms of colleagues and how we adapted to that was remarkable. Now in 2020, that really good initiative that we made, and we're very proud of the fact that we successfully transitioned from the car, which I think in Ireland we're all very better to, um, <laughs> Uh, to 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 maybe the transition to public transport is now a challenge for us because now you know 
public transport is a concern, understandably. And I know this morning now face masks are going to be required on public transport. So we're trying to, again, use these listening sessions with the polls and poll surveys. So we need to get better at, to be honest. We are looking as well at, I think one of the two things for me that are really important is, is that we build trust and we build our communication. Um, and we are looking at a new internal kind of communications charter as well to adapt to where we are now, because we have, we use Yammer, every week we use a 12 a 12, which is 12 minutes after the executive committee where the director general will give an update to all staff as to what's happening. It's really good, it's quick. We, um, everyone tunes in, we turn on our videos, we meet each other's dogs and kids, and you know, we put on different virtual backgrounds. And you know, we have, we try and make it as light and have that connectivity on it. But it is something that we're actively looking at how we can improve more communications um, so that people feel that they're informed and that they are kept in the loop. And even if we don't have the answers, which we probably don't to some extent, that we were beginning to get a sense of what it will look like when we go back in terms of some social distancing. But in reality, until we're back and how that actually will work, particularly in a hybrid model, that is all yet to, to actually be felt by staff. Carol, Carol, I'm just interested in, in a couple of things that you're saying mm. there. Um, uh, one of the things, I suppose, that you, you were mentioning holidays there and, and work-life balance. And uh, I suppose just something that, that we have done recently is, I suppose, with our employees, um, because, as I mentioned, uh, most of them aren't in their home country uh, mm. because we have the, the 19 or 20 different nationalities. Uh, one of the things so we looked at the whole annual leave mm. piece as well and and sort of considered, OK, you know, what we found with our employees was they were keeping their leave. Uh, to use when hopefully restrictions would lift. And that's very understandable because obviously they wanted to go back and, and see their families and, and go home. And, you know, we, we recognised that some of them were maybe feeling like, oh my God, I'm sort of trapped in Ireland here, you know, and, 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 and I'm going to keep my leave on, until, um, until I can go somewhere. So in fact, we listened obviously to, to all of the concerns and what we did actually here in Cassie, uh, I suppose to help our employees uh, have some balance and, and, and to help with their well-being um, and also to be honest uh, around sort of a, a retention uh, of our staff who, who we absolutely want to keep uh, here. We introduced a temporary policy and that temporary policy is allowing our employees to work uh, remotely from abroad, so from their home country. Um, so they have two options. They can work uh, remotely from abroad on either side of a holiday. So for example, two weeks before a holiday and two weeks after a holiday, uh, giving them six weeks uh, between now and August. Um, or they can work uh, on a medium term because I suppose what, what we felt was, look, our employees are working remotely anyway. Um, you know, as it happened, one or two of our employees happened to be on holidays at the time when the lockdown happened. So we have an employee working uh, from India, for example, who, who got stuck uh, there, but, but with his family, thankfully. Uh, now, obviously we got legal advice on all of this because that was very important uh, during this, this pandemic to get that legal advice and we did get that advice. Uh, yeah. But we were very happy uh, at Cassie as a management team that we were in fact able to, to support that. And, you know, that we were able to facilitate our staff uh, you know, mm. being able to see their families because that's so important to them and, and, and we all understand that. And I suppose uh, yeah. that way we know that they've been able to have a break, uh, reconnect, uh, and also the, the annual leave, which had backed up, is now beginning to be used. I suppose ju just in terms as well of, of the work-life balance, I'm interested I'm, in. I'm, I'm going to jump in there if I can, just for a second, just in terms of time, right? So uh, I just, I have one more question for Carolyn, if I could, and we, we come to the other points there at, at questions and answers if, if that's okay and that's really interesting in terms of, of course of uh, Carolyn you've had extensive experience both in the in the private sector and in the public sector and if you're to look forward now 12 months and and let's say I don't know in some way we're out of this and we have returned to the new normal what are you sure that we will hold on to well, you know what, what have you learned here that you're saying this is going to be useful in the future I, I think for me 
I, and again, seeing it from both the public and the private, which actually aren't hugely different in a lot of respects. Um, <clears throat> it's, even though it's quite surprising, even me saying that. Um, but I think one thing is, is the smart working policies. And I think that is something that is going to, we're going to have to em embrace. And I'm very supportive of that. And when I say smart working policies, I think it is going to be that combination of hours worked, um, how they were working, moving to a different approach on that. Um, and I think that's something like, say, for example, I think the government are, 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 you know, the Greens I know in government are looking at maybe a day a week of, of requiring the public sector workers to work a day a week from home. So that's something that we'll have to watch very closely to see how we, how we adjust to that. But I think that that will be a, a part of our future, um, certainly. What we're trying to figure out now is how even, we're rarely using this, COVID response period to trial some of these initiatives. And one thing that's been coined in SFI is we're trying to think about back to better. So that's something that we're trying to establish in our strategy is that there's an opportunity here. And whatever we do is hopefully we can take something from something that's been very challenging for most and actually create something that is better for, for our staff and the organization. So this back to better, where it's kind of nearly in two phases. One is you know, we'll learn throughout this, this response period and the slow gradual return. When I say we're returning potentially from 10th of August, I think it'll be a very limited basis. It's more for those that wish to return, that feel that maybe they can't work optimally at home. We know that everyone can work from home, that is proven. Um, we, we, we've identified that, but there are some staff that interestingly enough, when one of the service we did, um, we asked people about their how they felt about returning to work and using public transport and if that in fact imp impacted their decisions and some of the responses were yes but it was actually because they they missed their cycle in the morning they missed they use it as a form of exercise um, or they missed that walk so it was a different experience for people so we will try and accommodate where possible staff to return to the office where we have a lovely office we've got you know we've got your sit stand desk you don't have that at home <laughs> you have an environment that's there that's maybe quiet and they can at least maybe have quite focused time but the challenge for us is what we're going to try and think about very closely is how we keep our culture improve our culture and build that connectivity between staff particularly for junior members of staff i'm quite conscious of as well that they learn a lot in the office by osmosis they learn by watching they learn by observing their peers and their mentors so how do we keep that um, environment and that balance of it so that they're not um, disadvantaged from like i know myself then through the years i learned so much about watching and observing others, um, you know, peers and managers and mentors during the years by attending a meeting, particularly when you're at different various parts of your career. So and how in a, we, in a few weeks if, time, if we Carl, we're, we're going to have a, a webinar specifically focused on learning and development yeah. in yeah. Kind of new environment and, and it'd be great to get your, your comments on that. But again, uh, I'm, I'm just noticing how we're doing on time. So <laughs> I, I'd like to sort of hand on to, to Fania there and Fania is going to talk to Helen. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Carolyn and Barbara. Just um, as a side note, the factor in your car, Jim, has probably led to the highest level of engagement in this on this webinar so far. Um, and we need to watch the cork theme, right? We've had an awful lot of it the last couple of webinars, so uh, time, to, time to calm that down a little bit, a little bit. Um, so yeah, absolutely delighted to welcome uh, Helen Gallagher, who is the Global Head of HR with Morgan McKinley, another very uh, experienced HR professional. Um, and Helen's actually going to bring some really unique insight today into the global impact of, of COVID-19. I know, Helen, when we were chatting yesterday, mm -hmm. you were saying you began navigating this back in January uh, yeah. when COVID-19 mm -hmm. hit, hit your APAC offices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and as of today, 10 out of 18 offices back in some form or another. Yeah, um, we sure so yeah, are. Yeah. Helen, yeah. Yeah, so maybe just to provide a bit of the, the global perspective, I guess, um, and our experience in Morgan McKinley. So we have 800 employees across nine countries um, and 18 offices. So yeah, like I've been working on the people impact of, of COVID since January when it, it uh, hit our Shanghai office first. And um, I guess, you know, we couldn't quite believe it in March when suddenly Leo announced uh, that sh schools were shutting. Um, and I have to say hats off to all the teachers. I have a new found respect to them after three months of homeschooling, which is thankfully coming to an end on Friday. <laughs> But yeah, like, I mean, it's, I suppose our, our learning from it in terms of the global perspective is it's so different in all of our different mm -hmm. 
and how people react and I suppose the cultural and societal impact and influence um, is, is really important to consider. And I think, you know, when I was working with our APAC leadership team on, on managing, um, I suppose, the, the people impact and, and yeah. the impact of, of uh, COVID, and you know, getting everyone set up for remote working and everything. And luckily, we were in a good position because, incidentally, last October we um, issued laptops to all of our 800 employees. So we set up, even though we didn't do remote working, and it was never culturally a, a thing for us. We had occasionally people working from home, but we didn't have a, a remote working culture, given that we're a sales business and a lot of people work in teams closely together. So you know, we were lucky on the tech side that we were ready to go. Um, but yeah, like, you know, I suppose bringing our, our APAC offices back um, the protocols are so different in the different locations. For example, in Hong Kong, um, you know, you can't enter the building without having your temperature checked. So there's thermal screenings in all of the offices, um, the majority of them anyway. And, you know, if, you, if you're over temperature, you're not admitted into the building. They all wear masks in the office all the time in our APAC offices. And, you know, I know there's a lot of discussion in Ireland about it at the moment. Um, but like, you know, anytime in the, the grocery or Duns or wherever, like it's really 50-50. And I think it is going to increase now with, with the, you know, the advice around wearing them on public transport. But in APAC, they just wear them all the time. But they don't socially distance. So, you know, we have um, a communications platform called Workfever that we use. And it's kind of like an Instagram Yammer type situation. Um, but it, it, it shows our global, um, it's really a great way of connecting actually with, with your global colleagues. And I keep on seeing pictures of everyone in, in meetings. Now they're all masked up, but they're like really close together. <laughs> actually, I'm in, in the Dublin office today. We opened uh, our Irish offices at the beginning of this month um, because we do provide essential uh, services to essential workers in terms of recruitment services. So we have been allowed to actually work um, in the office if, if, if required. Now we chose not to and um, because there wasn't really an appetite people were quite comfortable working from home and they were all set up and um, but we when we pulsed our organization um globally and and i suppose i'm talking about the ireland specific now uh, a lot of people were really struggling at home and you know they were finding it tough going and they wanted to come back and um, so we kind of fast tracked and got our protocols ready and i am in the office and i have to say uh, you know otherwise i'd be sitting in my car like you jim with <laughs> It's, so it's it's pretty nice. It's pretty nice having a bit of, of peace and quiet. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like I mean, the, just a one size fits all approach certainly is not you know is not appropriate when you're when you're thinking about uh, the return. And also, different locations have been impacted differently. So our UK business, um, you know, people are quite nervous about returning. Now they are, you know, we're doing a phased return over there as well. But obviously, the incidents. Um, of COVID has been much higher um, in the UK and in Ireland and in other locations as well. So, you know, and you've got a, a different situation with public transport and the tube and, you know, the, the kind of the concentration, the density of the population there. So certainly, you know, it's been really important to us to pulse check the organisation globally to see how people are feeling, what their concerns are, um, and, you know, how has this pandemic impacted on them? And, you know, something that we've really found is the mental impact on this has been massive. Yeah. Like people have been navigating all sorts of complications, scenarios with homeschooling and um, looking after maybe some vulnerable uh, family members. Um, you know, maybe somebody in their income has lost their job or their income has been negatively impacted. So affordability is, is becoming an issue. Um, isolation where they might be living on their own and not able to see their family. Um, you know, Barbara, you mentioned about your colleagues who are from lots of different countries. We have the same here, who, people who have not been able to return home, people who have suffered bereavements during this pandemic and haven't been able to travel to funerals. So, you know, I think we're probably only starting to see the mental health impact of this pandemic on, on people, just employees, you know, society in general. From, from early days, um, we've been really cognizant of that and we've been really trying to um you know you know on a on not on a big budget by any means but trying to implement strategies to support people um, and to support them with their mental health so we, you know we we always um, celebrate uh, that's the word mental health awareness month in may so we did a lot of virtual um initiatives during that month um you know, 
similar to, to Carolyn and Barbara, we do the, the comms, the weekly updates, um, you know, trying to encourage as much uh, virtual collaboration as possible, bearing in mind that people are getting a bit fatigued with Zoom calls and, and you know, hangouts and stuff like that. So we're just trying to find the balance um, in kind of a new, this new world that we're all in at the moment. Yeah, I know we were we were chatting yesterday that we haven't seen anybody's side profile in months. It's yeah, only everybody, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> different face, same piece. Um, and I, 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 again, similar to, to Carolyn and Barbara, what they were talking about earlier, I, I know you have quite a young demographic and you would have a lot of people in, in house shares and, and that kind of yeah. thing. So making yeah. sure you were having those conversations with people and that want to yeah. come back to the office yeah. has, has been a big one. And you, yeah. you, would have, you would have had a heavy focus on health and well-being in the run-up to this. So I imagine that investment has been useful for you but has it has it changed do you think um and do, do you see that changing moving forward yeah like i think now people are absolutely you know health and well-being and safety is top top of everybody's agenda and you just see it in the changes in behaviors and you know i, I think back to the, the great places to work event and it was just at the end of february <laughs> I remember I wasn't going to go because we had a board meeting, but then it was cancelled because our APAC leadership team couldn't travel. And it just seems like a million years ago. But even, you know, coming up to kind of D-Day of, of, of mid-March, um, you know, I was at a few conferences and it was kind of, do you shake hands, do you not shake hands? All that's done now. People are not shaking hands. You know, even though, you know, families are reuniting and getting back together, people are really quite still maintaining that level of distance physically. Um, they're so aware of their, their health and safety. And one thing I would say, and I'm sure you're, you're all doing it when you're planning your return to work, is um, a return to work pack, a care pack, is a really a good thing that we did. Um, now, we only have small numbers back um, in, across our business uh, at the moment because it's very much on a choice basis. But uh, having a pack with the, the reusable masks, the hand sanitizers, the desk wipes, you know, just some stuff like that just gives people a sense of security most of us are working in, in kind of shared buildings. So the buildings have their own regulations and the sanitizer, everything and everywhere. And this protocols that we're all following in terms of lifts. We were talking about, <laughs> we're all going to be fit as fiddles because we don't use lifts <laughs> anymore. It's, it's up and down the stairs. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's become really front and center for people. Um, if somebody coughs now, you're just like, oh, who's coughing? <laughs> It's, it's just, we're, we're, we've become quite, um, and I suppose there's a fine line between being careful and people getting very, very anxious and stressed and worried about it. Um, and, you know, public transport is certainly an issue in, in, in anyone located in Dublin because most companies don't have parking um, in the city centre. So, you know, you're dealing with that level of anxiety. So, you know, we're offering people who, who, who are coming back in the, in, the, in the coming phases, you know, adjusted start and finish time so maybe they can avoid those particularly busy times because yeah. the buses still have restrictions in terms of capacity and um, you know there's I think it's 18 people on a double decker bus in, in Dublin bus at the moment so you know that could just sail right by you if, if you're on a busy kind of part of the suburbs so you know allowing people a lot of flexibility in terms of start and finish times is really important um, and also you know I think we've you know, and we, it's kind of a common theme. We were, we were actually ironically about to launch our remote working or flexible um, policy. Theme of the day, everybody March. was smiling at yeah. yeah. <laughs> and suddenly that's gone in the bin, all that work. But um, <laughs> yeah, like, um, you know, it's just an expectation now. And there was this two pieces of research that I thought was, was really interesting um, during this pandemic. One is the, the NUIG, the Whitaker Institute um, National Remote Working Study. And that was published in May. And 83% of respondents said that they wanted to continue working remotely in some capacity post pandemic. Mm. So this is here to stay. Like people aren't going to just suddenly go, okay, pandemic, we're back to the office. So it's changed people's behaviors and expectations of what work looks like. Um, and interesting in that study, 51% of the respondents had never ever worked remotely. Um, and of those 51%, 78% wanted to continue. And so even people that didn't really know what it was like or or had never done it and maybe weren't even properly set up at the time, really want to continue with that. And that's saying a lot because it's not a really a good situation for a lot of people who have caring responsibilities or who have another partner working from home or who might be in a house share with you know, lots of adults all day to um, you know, work remotely. Um, so we're not in this ideal remote working situation, but you know, come the end of the restrictions and, and life getting back to some, some normality, it will, you people will be a lot more productive, um, you would imagine, without all those, those kind of 
it's distractions and kind of uh, is to be dealing with. So like that certainly is is here to stay. And I think that's that, that's a, a, an interesting piece. Yeah. The other one, um, which, you know, because trust, I know, is, is the pillar for great places to work. Um, the Edelman Trust Index, which was published in March, um, another interesting piece of research stated that um, the respondents stated that they trusted their employer more than the government or media during this pandemic. So that in itself is a massive responsibility um, for people to kind of be thinking, okay, how I communicate and the message I put out there to my teams and to my people and, and that's, you know, it's a huge responsibility to have that level of trust and that's, they're really relying on you to kind of lead, lead from the front and keep their, well, their well-being and their safety at the forefront um, at all times. And yeah. you get that back in, in spades if, if, you, if you trust people to do the right thing, give them the flexibility and, and the compassion as we've talked about, um, you know, I think you, you, will get, you will get so much back in return. Uh, yeah, it's brilliant. Thanks so much for, for, for that, Helen. Actually, there's, there's a couple of questions that have come in, uh, one from yeah. Denise specifically around those practical elements. It was really useful to have your experience of having gone back into the office. These mm -hmm. are things we're beginning to, to think about. So so thanks for that. Um, and thanks to everybody. I'm, I know we, I'm conscious we've got five minutes left and there are a couple of questions in. So um, we might jump into those and, and, and kind of see, see where we go from there. Uh, somebody has asked about specifically around uh, learning and development. As Jim mentioned, we do have a specific what learning and development is going to look like now and into the future coming up in, in mid-July. So we'll share the details of that. But a, a question in from Geraldine, be interested to get everyone's response to this. So all of you have talked about the fact that your people have kept the show on the road, right? You know, it's, it's the strategic plans are still in place. You're, we're still serving customers, clients, the whole lot. Is there anything in particular you're going to do to, to recognize employees for that or have you started things already i suppose has anybody got any 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 elements around that i don't mind hopping in there uh, i do something sorry barbara you're about to, to jump as <laughs> well but just a very, a very quick one that and actually literally my next meeting after this is to is to spot on this out so it's hot on the press it hasn't even been launched yet but we're launching a covid heroes program um, so we do a lot of recognition, Brilliant. values heroes and support stars and, you know, fear earners obviously top in. And, you know, it's really challenged at the moment, I guess. Um, and, you know, we want to, to find a way to uh, recognize and appreciate all those people that have gone beyond during this difficult time. And that's everybody from the office management team who have really gone to town on the offices. They look like they've never been cleaner, tidy desks, everything. <laughs> To, you know, we've had some uh, people that have put their hand up to run meditation sessions during Wellbeing Week, um, to those people that have just, you know, really done so much extra beyond their normal uh, day job to get people up and running and working successfully remotely. Um, so, yeah, it's, we're calling it COVID heroes, you know, subject to change. And it does, like, real heroes are obviously the healthcare heroes, so we want to be cognizant of that. But, uh, you know, it's, it's just a nice thing to recognize and we'll do some CEO recognition and, a, and a, just a voucher or a, a just a voucher or something like that um, as a recognition. So we are, we are rolling that out um, on the 1st of July next, next week. Yeah, interesting. Uh, just to say, I guess, uh, recognition is something that's very important for us as well. And actually one of our uh, goals this year was working on a recognition program. We're good at recognizing uh, staff and Cassie as well. We're good at celebrating. Uh, Jim will know that. So we do put uh, a lot of emphasis it's celebrating, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> we do put a lot of emphasis on that as well and we're looking forward to uh, being able to celebrate uh, the achievements and all of the work that has been done uh, together hopefully soon in, in some way i suppose throughout the the the, um, the COVID crisis as well we've done things like we have delivered um various uh, hampers and thank you gifts i guess to staff as well throughout the the process so um we had a fruit hamper at one point um uh, from danny brook fair delivered to all of our staff and then uh, because our staff appreciate food very much uh, <laughs> and cheese and wine um uh, coming uh, from both the french and, and the italian we had a nice hamper around that as well but definitely i think uh, recognition uh, for staff and um celebrating those achievements uh, is going to be something uh, very important and we look forward to doing that actually hopefully uh, in small groups um, face to face as well uh, well not literally face to face as we know but <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah going yeah. forward yeah in fact I'm in the office today and uh, 
uh, you know, I, I do enjoy uh, remote working as many of our staff do and, and definitely our plans, we've started to engage with staff now uh, through surveys uh, and through focus groups and meetings uh, around what the future will look like and, you know, um, what we hope to have is a future that was even better than before and uh, one where we can have a, a bit of balance um, uh, as well as, uh, as mm. work. So I suppose we're engaging with our staff around that the future does look very different, but we're excited about it. I think there's a lot of uh, positive change uh, that can, can come from this and we'll have a future, I think, that was uh, possibly even better than the one before. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Much appreciated and Helen really, I mean, it, it's, it's been educational and engaging and, and I'm very thankful for you for taking the time mm -hmm. and for being so willing to, to, to share and to be honest and I really appreciate that. Brilliant. Um, that is us. It is 11. Thank you everybody who, who were with us today, to all our participants and in particular to, to Jim and our panellists. Uh, thank you all so much for, for your insight. I can see um, the, the messages coming into the chat now. Lots of thanks, lots of gratitude. So thank you all for being so candid and um, for sharing your insight and uh, looking forward to our next webinar on July 9th. So thanks bye everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.